And this evening's presentation is a lecture and book signing of Hudson River, Hudson Valley Romans, Forgotten Landmarks of an American Landscape, with authors and photographers Thomas Rinaldi and Robert J. Gassensack. They are available for book signing and questions after the lecture and will be setting up in the back. Thomas Rinaldi grew up in the Hudson Valley near Pitsay, New York. He is the co-author of Hudson Valley Ruins, Forgotten Landmarks of an American Landscape, published by the University Press of New England in 2006, and the author of New York Neon, published by W.W. Norton in 2012. His photographs have been published in the Times, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Post, the New York Observer, Westchester Magazine, CNN Online, and elsewhere, and have been exhibited at the Municipal Art Society of New York, and will be shown in the forthcoming exhibition at the New York State Museum in Albany, which is actually going on now. Right. Um, he holds degrees from Georgetown University and Columbia University, and has worked for the National Park Service, the New York State Office of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation, and the Central Park Conservancy. Rinaldi currently works as an architectural designer in New York City. And Robert Gassensack is originally from Terrytown in Westchester County. In the 1990s, he began to photograph local ruins while taking photography classes at Irvington High School. Rob later attended SUNY Oswego, where he interned at the Age Lee White Marine Museum. His first book, Prayer of the Lodge, was published by Arcadia Publishing in 2004. Rob works for Historic Hudson Valley, and he currently resides in Katona. Tom and Rob co-authored Hudson Valley Ruins, Forgotten Landmarks of an American Landscape, published in 2006 by the University Press of New England. Their photography and architecture exhibition, Hudson Valley Ruins, opened at the New York State Museum in August 2016 and remains on display until the end of this year, December 31st, 2017. Thank you.
Um, and uh, the town just kind of grew up around this building, and it was this place of great historical significance until underappreciated and in ruins until one day this happened. And this coincidentally, or not, happened about a week after plans were announced to build a new chain fast food restaurant that shall remain nameless on the site. Uh, so this happened as it happened right before my eyes, and this was a building that I always just sort of took it for granted would one day be restored and turned into something we could really be proud of, uh, and turned into the kind of things that we go, you know, we travel great distances to see on family vacations. Uh, it was really, I wouldn't have described it in these terms as a 14-year-old kid in high school, but it was kind of a, the cultural identity of the town uh, was this building. Uh, and so I, I sort of thought, one day, sure, they'll, they'll you know, bring that back, it's inevitable. Uh, but this turned out to be more inevitable uh, than that. And so I spent about the next year or so uh, photographing what was left of it, knowing that it wasn't going to be around much longer, knowing that this was a place of great historic significance, uh, and at least there should be this photographic record because probably there would be not a lot else left of it, and that, of course, is what happened. Um, so from there, I just started photographing similar kinds of places, uh, kind of moving in a farther, a wider and wider radius from uh, where I grew up in Pleasant Valley across the river, uh, and found places like this. This is a building that's just outside the city of Hudson across the river on State Route 66. It's the Jan van Hosen House, which was, it's thought to have been built circa 1723, so one of the oldest uh, buildings in the Hudson Valley. Uh, this is a building that some people recognize, the Hudson River State Hospital, Hudson River Psychiatric Center, just north of the city of Poughkeepsie, uh, which it turned out was a building of great architectural and design significance. The grounds were by uh, Calvin Voss and Frederick Law Olmsted, who did Central no best for doing Central Park. Uh, the buildings by Voss and uh, uh, Frederick Clark Withers, so really one of the most significant buildings architecturally. Uh, another building significant for its architecture, this, does anybody recognize this little Fragment. CIA. What's that? CIA. No, not CIA, but sort of of the same build. This is the West Shore train station in the uh, city of Newburgh, which it turns out was designed by the same architects, the same co architects of Grand Central Terminal uh, in New York. This uh, is one that's much closer. This is a building, uh, one of the kiln sheds of the Hutton Brickyard, which now happily has a better outlook lately. Uh, but this was the, it's the last, now the last intact remnant of a Hudson River brickyard, which was this definitive industry that was so crucial in the development of the region. Here's one that's just up the street here. Uh, when the Hudson River Valley was probably the most important center of cement making uh, in the world, arguably, in the 19th century, uh, an industry that's long, long gone, but has left these uh, remnants around in, their, uh, in ruins, but still very important to the history of the region. Ice harvesting on the Hudson River, another, another long vanished industry that really went belly up with the advent of uh, electric refrigeration a very long time ago, obviously. Uh, and it sort of uh, just uh, informally held that there's nothing left of the ice harvesting industry. But if you look carefully, you'll find remnants like this, which is the ruin of a powerhouse that uh, powered machinery that hoisted the uh, ice cakes up out of the river where they could be stored in the ice house. Uh, until it's time for them to be shipped out someplace. Um, and then this, which kind of serendipitously, for the purposes of our putting the book together, made sort of a great grand finale. In the book, we kind of move uh, with the course of the river from the north to the south. And this is the uh, sort of kind of southern extent you cut off before New York City. Uh, this is, was the uh, uh, Yonkers power station for the New York Central and Hudson River Railroad, which was built when they were electrifying the tracks to facilitate the construction of the new Grand Central Terminal. And this was built by the other co-architects of Grand Central Terminal. So a building that is uh, significant as an industrial building, significant also for its architecture, and also uh, probably the biggest building that we photographed. Um, it was really, our kind of paths intersected though. It turned out Rob was doing the same thing at about the same time. Uh, and in, it was April 1st, 1999, and just as Amtrak's travel planner featured Bannerman's Island on its cover. Uh, Rob and I met at Bannerman's Island. We've both been posting our photos on our college websites, and I had wanted to get out to Bannerman's forever, and Rob had an in. And so we went out there to kind of clean up and do some gardening one day. Uh, and so that is where our paths crossed on the day that I took this photo. I think it was that day. Uh, so here's Rob. Thank you, Tom. Thanks a lot, folks. Good to be here tonight. We've 
trading off a few more times, as Tom mentioned earlier. Uh, the fellow in the last photograph in that boat was actually a fellow who went to the same high school I did, a guy by the name of Jim Logan. And it was with him and a lot of other people were able to take a lot of these photographs, especially if it was required to be out on the river. And uh, the cover shot of our book was made possible by the fact that Jim was generous enough to take us out on the river a few times as well. Uh, Jim actually grew up in the same neighborhood that I did in southern Terrytown, uh, the south end of Terrytown, with lots of old uh, millionaires' mansions and estates. Anybody ever been to these two properties? Uh, some of the more significant, nationally significant properties in the country were located pretty much right in my backyard, walking distance from where I grew up. And I actually worked at Linters for a while before I began working for Historic Hudson Valley, which owns and operates Sunnyside. And I've had a long connection with these properties uh, since I was you know, walking past and going to and from school sometimes. But it was also other areas that were attracting my interest as well. I noticed as I was walking along the old Crypt Aqueduct, there would be ruins in the woods. This house was actually long gone by the time I was going around with my camera as a high school student. But a fellow by the name of John Tukaski photographed it the very year that I was born. Uh, he was an architectural historian who had worked for the Hudson River Museum and had done a couple of publications on old houses in the Hudson River Valley. This house was actually right next to Washington Irving's Sunnyside, and for a long time it had been a home that his niece had lived in with her husband, a fellow by the name of Moses Hicks Grinnell. But it was in ruins by the 20th century, as many other mansions were, as they fell out of favor and uh, local fortunes dipped and dwindled. But there were still remnants to be found in the place where the house was gone. I would see things like this old stone bridge there, or a small fountain, or just uh, a foundation of an old carriage house or something. And these things really caught my eye. I wanted to know, you know what they were, what had been there. And I've done some local research at the historical societies and libraries, and I found photographs such as this one that had been taken at that very estate, Wolfert's Dell, which in the early 20th century was owned by a couple named Russell and Vera Hopkins who had a private menagerie on their estate. So there were lots of photographs of these exotic animals here that were in the woods that I now exploring. And then there are other houses that were long gone and didn't leave a trace behind. I would see photographs of them in books or sometimes on TV. Does anybody recognize this house? Anybody a fan of the TV series Dark Shadow? Don't be embarrassed. Uh, I'm not really one to go into ghosts or whatever, I had to go through the experiences, but there's an actual photograph of a vampire in an abandoned mansion here. <laughs> Jonathan Frey dressed up as Barnabas Collins, so this is the house that you see in the TV version of Dark Shadows. It was uh, actually last owned by Anna Gould of Linters, and after she passed away, uh, the house was no longer occupied. Uh, her bodyguard actually lived here. And then uh, the National Trust took over the main portion of Flinthurst and sold off the adjoining properties, and this house eventually burned in 1969. And then across the street from Flinthurst, there was another old estate. A lot of these mansions were built right around the time that the New York Central Railroad came through around 1851. And speculators built these mansions and financiers and business people came up from New York City and started living up in what had been previously old farmsteads. And this was an estate called Greystone. The house actually burned in 1972. This was actually the carriage house or a stable complex, but still a uh, very impressive building architecturally and size. And there were also these picturesque Gothic cottages, which may also have been there from the time the estate was developed in the mid-late 1800s. Uh, but they had been abandoned. The last tenant was a day camp, which closed in the 1980s. And in 1996, that stable complex was burned down, and uh, these buildings were demolished shortly thereafter. And just last year, the property was finally redeveloped. There are a bunch of, I guess they call them McMansions on the property now, that go for $10 million and up. And just north of Linhurst was another estate called Pinkstone. What's the technique? What's the magic trick? I was getting it real close. Real close. So uh, Pinkstone was a property that was also built around the 1850s. In fact, the date stone says 1859, if you can even read that. And this had been a inhabited through the 1970s, and then after the last occupants moved out, uh, the buildings were sequentially torn down one by one, and this was the last structure standing. And I photographed in early 1995, and had gone off to college later that year, and had come home for a winter break, wanted to go wander around the woods and take some photographs, and walked down to the property and found not this, but bulldozers and empty lot. 
So at the time, I was taking a lot of photographs of buildings that were uh, disappearing pretty rapidly. This one was an old municipal hospital that was built just for the village of Tarrytown. A lot of these old villages had their own municipal services, but with the 20th century, a lot of communities consolidated and uh, had larger hospitals built nearby. This one was eventually abandoned and turned into a nursing home, which later closed in the 1970s. And for 20-some years, there was a sign on the Port Cochere which said, historical building under renovation. I took this picture about a month before the building was actually demolished. <laughs> And then there was an old Immaculate Conception Church, which was just down the hill from the high school I attended. Likewise, in the 1970s, a lot of churches wanted to build newer church buildings, and <coughs> old ones either to rot or demolish them outright. This one had a fire, but a lot of the interior details survived intact. And as a school kid, I'd actually wander around there after hours with some of my friends, and we'd just kind of check it out and just be on our way afterwards. And then later, as I was in high school, I'd kind of wander back in there with my camera and take some photographs. And uh, right around that time in the 1990s, the uh, church was getting worried for some reason, whether it's insurance or development or some other reasons. They were interested in, at that point, finally 25 years later, tearing down the building. And the letter I copied out of the newspaper here, the Reverend uh, blamed it on the kids in the area. You read there in the lower left there, uh, saying that the building was dangerous and the kids were in the area, so there was some concern about someone getting injured instead of doing something proactive with the building and fixing it up and making it useful for the community, uh, they decided to board it up and then eventually get rid of it. Here in Kingston, the very opposite mindset was taken with Kingston City Hall, where Mayo Gallo said it sent the message to the youth of the city that there's no future here, that if you want to do something successful, you need to move beyond Kingston. So he wanted to make a, a point of city pride to restore City Hall. We're very thankful that that building that had been abandoned for about 28 years was restored. So uh, doing all this research at local historical societies, I was very much uh, thankful I had the help of folks who ran these organizations and shared the information, maps, and photographs, uh, particularly at Tarrytown, Sleepy Hollow, and in Irvington. Uh, the village of Story, there was a fellow named Peter Oley, who was actually my fourth grade teacher. And through him, I actually was first really inspired to take note of these kind of off the beaten track places that we would find in the woods along the old Croton Aqueduct in Irvington. Uh, he took us on walks to all these kind of places like the Hermit's Grave, which was kind of a local landmark up behind the reservoir. A fellow who had a little shop up there making buttons that he would sell on Main Street lived up in the woods and there was his headstone and the foundation of the tool shop and that was about it. And then there were also places like the Octagon House. Is anybody familiar with that mansion? It's uh, known formally as the Armour Steiner House and it's probably the single best, if not the only remaining dome octagonal house in the United States in the Second Empire style. And with nearly a wreck uh, in the 1970s, its last occupant had been the author Carl Carver. Do you know him? Uh, famous Hudson River author and wrote about a lot of places in America as well. Uh, but after he passed away, it was sent to the National Trust for Historic Preservation, but they did not have the resources to fix it up. Uh, so an architect by the name of Joseph Palomari said, Louis spent the last 30-some years restoring this house. And he's done an incredible job inside and out. And then there was my high school photography teacher, Tom Johnson. Tom Rinaldi mentioned earlier that we met at Bannon's Island Arsenal in 1999. Tom Johnson was my high school photography teacher, and he was a founder of the Bannon Castle Trust. So through him, I had legitimate access to go out to a place that either people can only dream about or can only trespass at. And uh, Tom was also uh, very much interested in ruins and history and architecture and trains and boats. So when I was in high school, he would share with me a lot of his own personal books that he would bring into school for me to take home, which I think was kind of rare at the time, but I was very thankful for his assistance. And some of those books I would highly recommend if you're interested in the subject. These are four of the books that were really uh, influential in kind of setting the scene of the Hudson River for us, uh, giving us a sense of place and buildings and architecture and people and stories. And some of these books can be had for just a few dollars if you're looking around on Amazon or ABE.com or some other places. And uh, Hudson River Guide by Arthur Adams actually includes a little bit of a map which would show kind of really not what the building was, but there'd be a little dot on the map and you know next to a small stream and Tom and I would be like, is that an old factory or something we should drop down there and see what that was? And hopefully there'd be a building there, sometimes there was, sometimes there wasn't, but that was pretty much the only way to find things in the 1990s, which just go out with a map and just drive around. I hope you can see something still there. And then there was the New York Times. Anybody a member subscribed to their service there? 
the new papers that go back to 1851 on their website, and a lot of our research for our book came uh, through their archive. And clearly, Tom and I were not the first people to talk about ruins along the Hudson River. They were talking about it back in 1882. And I'm sure after the years, people will be talking about abandoned buildings along the Hudson River as well. Uh, so it will come and go in cycles of periods of uh, wealth and prosperity, periods of downtimes. Uh, and it was around that time in the 1990s that Tom and I were probably cognizant that the thing were kind of turning upwards, and a lot of these old buildings that had been sitting there and fallow for 30 or 40 years were uh, starting to face an uncertain future that they may or may not be around. Uh, and we really better pick up our camera and start running around and taking more photographs before they disappear like the other ones that we saw. So I'll turn this back over to Tom and look at a little bit of history of the Hudson River and how it kind of went through those periods and cycles of prosperity and decline and how it kind of came to that point in the 1990s that we found so many abandoned buildings. In the book. In the book we found that we could tell the story of the region through these buildings. Uh, and so uh, we did a bit of that and tried to get into also a little bit the history of the appreciation, not just the history of the region, but the history of ruins in the region and the history of people who had kind of come before us in an appreciation of uh, ruins in various kinds of contexts over the years. So we'll kind of sit through the history, the Hudson River history, because I think we would mostly are good with that <laughs> in this room. But 1609 is what uh, now historians refer to as the point of European contact when Henry Hudson uh, arrived here, the Dutch colonies uh, developed uh, along the Hudson River primarily, uh, with the important settlements, uh, of course, being New Amsterdam. Uh, 17, 1664, this happened. <laughs> Couldn't find a good uh, English word. Uh, <laughs> and the British were here from 1664 until 1776, uh, when we threw them out. Uh, the Hudson River being a very important uh, factor in the story of our throwing out of the British. Uh, the British tried to use the Hudson River to kind of split the colonies, the northern colonies, from the southern colonies. So strategically, it was a very uh, important um, kind of defense corridor. Uh, so George Washington, of course, spent a fair amount of time in the Hudson River Valley and a number of historic sites uh, associated with his having been here. Here's Washington crossing the Delaware, not the Hudson, but uh, the, the river's a real kind of, uh, uh, kind of critical role in the development of the nation, though, really came in. 19th century with the opening of the Erie Canal in 1925, uh, and of course the DH Canal shortly thereafter, but the Erie Canal kind of opened up the whole American interior, the whole interior of the continent, the continent by way of the Great Lakes, uh, making the Hudson River into this kind of artery um, by way of which uh, all goods going to and from the interior of the continent uh, were going up and down the river uh, just out uh, to the east of us here. Um, and so you had the appearance of all kinds of uh, industrial sites like this up and down the river uh, over the course of the 19th century. This is very close to here. Uh, does anybody recognize that chimney? <laughs> There's a slide of it later that's a little bit more recognizable. That's the chimney of the Schultz Brickyard that's up in East Kingston uh, from an old image. Uh, and in some of these images, you'll notice the importance of the river kind of uh, to, the, uh, to the, the whole operation that was going on. Uh, here is a scene, uh, basically right where we are right now, uh, showing the natural cement industries along the Wandao Creek in the 19th century, uh, the opening of the railroad between 1849 and uh, 1851 on the east side of the river, and then followed on the west side of the river a couple of decades later, uh, kind of took a lot of the traffic off of the actual water itself, but it kept the kind of commercial uh, focal points uh, more or less along the river uh, in that kind of maintaining that lineal uh, importance of the river as a transportation corridor. Um, more industrial sites like this, this is just a great image of the bleachery, the Garner Bleachery, uh, which is over across the river in Dutchess County, Walkers Falls. It's Walkers Creek uh, kind of winding through there on its way to the Hudson River. Uh, here's maybe one of my favorite images, uh, which we just thought was a great find. Here's one that uh, probably a lot of us drive past on a fairly regular basis. This is the Alsons American Portland Cement Works. Uh, in a place that became known as Cementing, that is now known by its previous name of Smith's Landing. And you can see in the background, I love a lot of things about this image, but you've got the railroad in the foreground, you've got the river in the background uh, there, and then of course these huge plumes of smoke uh, blocking the river completely out of sight. These buildings are still around, uh, 
uh, in ruins today. All different kinds of industries uh, up and down the river. This was the National Stove Works in Peekskill. Peekskill apparently was a big center of stove making, we learned in the course of researching this. And this gave way to very prosperous, especially prosperous communities in small cities up and down the river. This is Main Street in Poughkeepsie uh, at the turn of the century. Uh, of course, the rise of these important works of architecture, the appearance of these important works of architecture up and down the river. This is an estate that was known as the Point. Uh, today, it's kind of better known as Point House. It appears in the local papers sometimes. As, uh, there are ongoing efforts, re efforts to restore it. It's just below the Mills Mansion, uh, over across the river. It's owned by New York State. Uh, important uh, as the work of architect Calvert Box, uh, who was one of the designers of Central Park. Um, cultural figures. Uh, like these guys, Thomas Cole, Washington Irving, Frederick Church, uh, and A.J. Downing, uh, figures in the, uh, leading figures in the developing cultural identity uh, of the United States, which was still kind of very much culturally in the shadow of Europe for much of the 19th century. Um, so the region starts to develop this kind of prominent uh, place in the, uh, the kind of identity of the whole country. Uh, and it becomes as early as uh, the 1840s, here's uh, 1840s uh, tourist guide to the region, uh, becomes basically a tourist destination. The Casco Mountain Resorts, the uh, Eastern Catskills early on, uh, being uh, kind of landmarks of that era. Uh, and this remains, and remains, of course, uh, right up through till today. There's a, uh, a New York Central Railroad advertising poster using uh, the imagery of the river uh, to sell train tickets. This painting I like because it kind of uh, stitches all these different themes together. So you've got the river as a transportation artery there in the background. You can see a steamboat uh, kind of in the foreground. This is a, a painting by uh, a man called Gifford Beale. Uh, I think it was painted about 1918. Uh, it's called On the Hudson at, anybody guess what city? Newburgh. Newburgh. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Get off of there. Um, so there's a plume of smoke on, uh, in the foreground, probably coming from a train on the West Shore Railroad. A plume of smoke way off in the distance is probably uh, from a, could be from a train or it could be from one of the brickyards that operated at a place called Duchess Junction, and this kind of thriving waterfront city that was Newburgh at that time. Well, fast forward to uh, the childhoods of Rob and I in the uh, last part of the 20th century, and this was the Newburgh waterfront. Uh, there with what was then the brand new uh, Hudson River Sloop Clearwater in the background. Uh, so what had kind of happened in those intervening decades? Well, industry that had been so important to the development of the region uh, kind of ran about, bless you, uh, by the later half of the 20th century. Uh, this proposal being kind of almost a, a watershed moment, uh, pun not intended, of the, the pump storage Con Ed power plant that was proposed for Storm King Mountain. Uh, and so people really kind of started to get a sense that this industry was starting to cut in and compromise on the quality of life in the region. Uh, and people kind of began to dig their heels in and say, no more of this. Uh, other things happen. Uh, so whereas at one point we had to uh, actually get on the water to cross the river, uh, as in the case of uh, this ferry boat, which we'll see a little later in the talk, um, we figured out how to build bridges. Um, in a great photograph uh, by a photographer called David Plowden of the Mid Hudson Bridge, uh, the Frank Roosevelt Bridge. Um, so with that, it was had a pretty measurable impact on a lot of these waterfront uh, areas, like the one that we're in right now. Uh, this is downtown, the waterfront section of downtown Newburgh, as it would have looked around the turn of the century. You can see a uh, 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 steamboat uh, tied up at the wharf, a ferry boat coming in, the railroad, which you can't quite see, threads its way through here. Uh, and so all these uh, transportation arteries that facilitated this development on the, the waterfront uh, suddenly kind of disappeared. And so this is that same stretch of the Newburgh waterfront uh, about 1970, just before it was all uh, erased from the landscape. Every single building in this photograph of what was Water Street in downtown Newburgh uh, is gone now, except for the one on the far right, which is the West Shore uh, Railroad Station, which has happily since been restored. Uh, but so this had an impact, as I said, on a lot of these urban centers up and down the river. Uh, that was downtown Newburgh in the last slide. Uh, this is uh, downtown Troy. Can you see where this bus is going? Walmart. Walmart. Bus to Walmart. Uh, passing Proctor's Theater in downtown Troy. Uh, so this was a phenomenon that was not just happening here, but happening across the country, uh, of course. Uh, ruins were not a new thing to the Hudson River. Uh, there were ruins like these. This was down uh, just below West Point. Uh, it was a, a ruined mill that uh, was 
depicted on one of those stereo view cards in the 19th century. Uh, so Rob and I were not the first people to live here with an appreciation for ruins. This was a painting by Thomas Cole. Uh, in fact, we found in our research that a lot of these painters and writers in the 19th century at the Hudson River School, uh, at the Washington Irving School, say, uh, lamented the lack of ruins in the Hudson River Valley. Uh, and so they would go to Europe to find them more. In this case, this is a, a ruin that Thomas Cole has kind of made up. Um, or they would build fake ruins, uh, like this one, which is not far from here, over on Kruger's Island, just kind of uh, near Red Hook, near Bar College, the ruins of which uh, still exist in a slightly, somewhat more ruinous condition than you see them here. Uh, there's a picture of them in the book, uh, what they look like now. But uh, we found also that as we were doing this in, say, the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, there was suddenly a new development spike happening in the region. And so a lot of these uh, places that have been kind of left fallow in the post-industrial uh, chapter of the Hudson River's history uh, were no longer uh, going to just be let to uh, waste away. And so suddenly there was a new demand for all this real estate for mostly residential development. And th these charts and graphs here are from one from the New York Times, one from the Kipsey Journal, uh, one more than 10 years ago, showing all the proposals for the tens of thousands of uh, new units of residential housing that were proposed just for the Hudson River waterfront, uh, to say nothing of the more inland kind of parts of the region. Um, and the other graph uh, showing a population spike that was happening. So in 2006, we came out uh, with this book, and Rob mentioned the, the building on the cover there is the, was the Anaconda Wire Plant uh, down in Hastings on Hudson in Westchester that had a very important role in the, the emergence and development of the whole environmental movement in the country uh, with landmark legal decisions, uh, one in particular uh, having come out of things that went on at that site. Uh, the last of the buildings that are on that site is now being demolished. This is the uh, one that has been going on already for some years. This is what was there at the site a few years later. Uh, soon there will be only the water tower uh, remaining there. Um, other buildings like this kind of were able to, to catch a little bit of the, the prosperity that was coming to the region as we were doing this. This was uh, one the, the second to last building, I guess, of the Dennings Point Brickyard on uh, Dennings Point, which was the spit of land that kind of comes out into the river just below Beacon in Southern Dutchess County. Uh, this is a building that had been derelict for, in the looks of it, probably a good 50 years or so. Uh, and it has since been turned into an environmental education center. Uh, and it's looking pretty good. Others didn't do so well. Did you recognize this place? Truly, I see some yeses and some noes. Uh, some emphatic yeses and emphatic noes. This is one I remember from my childhood on Route 9 in Poughkeepsie right across from Marist College. This building was built in the very early 20th century uh, as a Fiat automobile factory and later became Western Publishing. So it was known for, through most of the 20th century as Western Publishing. They published Golden Books, uh, children's books there. Uh, became later the Mid-Hudson uh, Business Park, but that didn't really take off. So this really beautiful uh, old building uh, was abandoned. Uh, it was replaced with this, uh, is what's uh, there now, the Staples has since gone out of business. Um, this is that chimney uh, that I mentioned earlier that uh, is up at East Kingston, just uh, up the river from here. Uh, so uh, getting back to this is kind of a, uh, to make the point that uh, uh, proposals for new industrial use of these sites, even if they've been historically used for industrial purposes, were no longer really viable here uh, in the region. This is kind of the, the reaction that proposals for industrial use get for riverfront land today. So the, what's happened instead is lots and lots and lots of residential development. Uh, and so in the years since our book has come out, um, there has been more and more discussion of, well, uh, maybe residential use isn't as bad for some of these sites as industrial use would be, doesn't have quite the uh, compromising effect on the quality of life in the region, that industrial use would have, but there are still impacts to be considered. And uh, one thing that Rob and I uh, considered as we were photographing all these places is how will these new things that we're building today up and down the river potentially weather the kinds of seismic change that the region has experienced over the past couple of hundred years. So in photographing these places, we were seeking to make a document of them, a record of them, uh, but also there was a little bit of a political bit that here in this region where uh, historic sites are really were, were raised to have a huge reverence for them, uh, and also they happen to be a huge part of the, the economy of the region, with tourism really being the, the kind of main industry of the Hudson River uh, in our generation now. 
uh, these historic sites that uh, had fallen in hard times were often just dismissed as eyesores and to be, you know, best that could happen to them is to get rid of them as quickly as possible. Um, this uh, particular ruin of recent vintage uh, was, and I think still is, down on Route 9 in Fish Kills, the Duchess Mall. Uh, so this was kind of a, how will these buildings sustain whether the changes that might be, we might not foresee now. Here's another one uh, that I think is not around anymore. This was in Rosendale. Uh, this was a vinyl sided ruin. Um, but uh, that versus this kind of ruin. That we like this kind of ruin better. Uh, but in any case, lots of food for thought with these ruins. And now we will look together at a number of specific uh, of these ruins. Uh, Well, on that note of, you know, what do you do with these sites that have been abandoned for 30 or 40 years? What happens to them? You know, you might think, well, if they're no longer being used, you just, should just tear them down. But uh, there have been a number of different outcomes. We've witnessed at uh, various ruins up and down the Hudson River. And uh, this place actually does have a happy story. We would drive past it, one of our favorite little schoolhouse ruins along the Hudson River, uh, overlooking a little bay in the village of Athens. And it was kind of Sometimes it looked like there was work going on, sometimes it just looked like work had stopped, that they advertised real estate ads and on and off, and uh, always kind of had that derelict look going on, however. But about three years ago, I drove past, and indeed somebody is fixing it up. It was an artist couple from uh, New York City who had found it and were moving up here, at least uh, on a part time basis, and were restoring it to uh, use as workspace and living space. So. Uh, thankfully, this old schoolhouse that we photographed about you know 15 years ago now, totally abandoned, the floor falling in, and, uh, a little desk there kind of falling into the basement, is actually being fixed up, and probably is, you know, has been fixed up since then. I think that photograph was 2014, the newer one. So there are indeed many positive outcomes for a lot of these places. That's just one example. And uh, Tom had mentioned the Newburgh West Shore Station before, the only survival of urban renewal on Water Street there, which had uh, actually been abandoned since 1958, and there been some story we heard about why it hadn't been redeveloped and political kind of behind the scenes machinations. But in any event, uh, about six years ago, it actually was finally restored to be put a roof back on the building, which is missing on the right half of the photograph there, and uh, renovated the inside. Although much of the original details had long been stripped away, when we photographed it in the early 2000s, there was still a little bit of uh, tracing of some of the plaster ornamentation. That's all been covered up by drywall now, it's still even there. Uh, but we're happy to report that it is a pizza shop on one half of the building, and the other half was actually being used as a theater space for a few years until the theater company moved out to a new location. So they're looking for a tenant to occupy the other half of the old train station. If you've got a business or an art space you want to bring down there, uh, they may still be looking for a tenant. Otherwise, then I'm down there and enjoy the pizza and the incredible architecture that Tom mentioned was designed by uh, Warren and Wetmore, the co-architects of Grand Central Terminal. And then, of course, here in Kingston is the Hutton Company Bricks Works, which was really, in you know, some respect, one of the more important industrial ruins along the Hudson River. Uh, there, of course, was the Yonkers Power Station down at the south end of the river, and the vast cement factories up in uh, near Catskill. Uh, but this one, as Tom mentioned, was the last intact brickyard along the Hudson River, at least as of about seven or eight years ago, when the Palominic Works in Queens were demolished. This also had a distinguishing uh, history of being the longest running brickyard, operating continuously from about 1865 to about 1980. And it shut down, uh, and that left Palominic as the last operator, and they were going up until about 2001. And these kiln sheds were once ubiquitous features up and down the Hudson River. A lot of the early generation brickyards had uh, wood drying sheds. Uh, these have an interesting history, having been built in 1940 uh, in Tavistrop and had been moved up to Hudson River in 1965 to Kingston. I think I'm getting the dates more or less approximate there. Uh, in any event, they've been repurposed from one brickyard to another and had been abandoned after the Hutton Company brickworks closed with remnants of the scope kiln left inside there. And you might say, what would you do with an old kiln shed, an old you know, metal building that's got holes in the roof and piles of brick all over the ground and who knows what else on the property? And it was one of those things that I had seen in my travels elsewhere around the country that had been restored and renovated. 
In the 1970s, when the Sloss Furnaces shut down in Birmingham, Alabama, the city acquired the site with the goal of preserving it and making it uh, a destination that people could travel to and that local artists could use. Uh, so in 2009, I went down there to attend a concert inside the old furnace structures there. You can see the blast furnace behind the stage there with the band set up. I thought that would be the perfect thing for the Hutton Company Brickworks here in Kingston. Anybody go to the Bob Dylan show a few months ago? Yeah. We weren't able to attend. I was out of town, but finally what I've been hoping for the last 15 or so years is actually happening here in Kingston now, along with a lot of other positive things. But it's really more of having package and present to say, you know, these families taking pictures of their kids in front of this abandoned metal hulking ruin, you know, I think it's kind of cool and hip and artsy, but you know, three or four years ago they might have thought it's an eyesore. But since it's being packaged as a site that could be a resource for the community and can bring a lot of people in and can do something productive and cool with, there's now a different mindset to viewing the site, and that's really going to be an important way of how you go about encouraging people to view these things not as eyesores, uh, but promoting them in a positive way and doing good things with them. Even structures such as the gantry crane are kind of being viewed as kind of an in-site artwork right there, kind of just a sculptural piece right along the river that people are admiring and photographing and hanging out underneath. And uh, one of those places that we would just kind of go to and hang out, just enjoy the river. There might be people riding ETVs there, or people fishing, or people just kind of hanging out doing their own thing, but it's a place where everybody just kind of was cool and let you do whatever you wanted to do, and we were photographing the ruins, and they would leave us alone. So it was always kind of a peaceful place to go and enjoy and photograph. But yet, at the same time, although we kind of missed that, it's kind of interesting to go and pull in there and see hundreds of cars there and people enjoying the site, you know, legally and uh, positively. So that's uh, a good thing, because otherwise, things like this didn't happen, these buildings would just be torn down, as a lot of the others we've seen were. And the history of the brick making is a fascinating story as well. It's actually been published in a couple of books, and you can not only read about it, but you can also go to the brick yards and kind of collect bricks, too, which is a little bit of a hobby. There's actually a website called brickcollecting.com, which is devoted to that. Are you a collector, too? Over 100. Over 100. Might be a little bit more than I've got, but I think Fred behind you probably got you beat. <laughs> okay, I got Fred. Afterwards, and people actually go to meets and trade bricks and stuff like that. So it's a pretty cool hobby because people are interested in the history of the river and the people and the places, the industries. But there's a lot of other places that are still, you know, 20 years after Tom and I have run around photographing, kind of still in this, you know, kind of transition or limbo. Uh, Bannerman's Island Arsenal actually had a lot of good things going on there. In fact, there's tours and programs and events out there. And there's been some preservation work. The Bannerman residence has been stabilized. But unfortunately, the main castle structure, the warehouse that Frank Bannerman stored his surplus military guns and uh, cannons and weapons and swords and everything stored inside there, has been ruined since 1969 following a fire of undetermined origin. And uh, unfortunately, suffered a couple of collapses in 2009 and 2010, reducing it to a further state of ruin. Uh, but I can report that the Bannerman Castle Trust has not only been selling out two tours a day, but they've actually added a third boat this summer. So doing three sold out tours, Saturdays and Sundays, really testifying to the interest in this site, even at more of a ruin than it was six or seven years ago. People are interested in this and want to see it be preserved and be reused. Uh, so at the very least, uh, it's being stabilized at the moment to keep it you know, standing still as a ruin while the main residence building up that Frank and Helen Bannerman lived in up the top of the hill actually been uh, renovated as a visitor center. So unfortunately, uh, time does get the best uh, people who have the best interests, so it's imperative to act fast and raise money and get politicians and local town boards in favor of the kind of project, because if you don't move fast enough, this is what's going to happen. And then there are places like Hudson River State Hospital, which the town has shown a few photographs of earlier, which has uh, been in the news the last couple of years as redevelopment proposals for the property seem to be moving forward at a faster pace than they were uh, when we were first photographing in place in the early 2000s. Actually, it was still active at a mental hospital at the time. Some offices in this building, which actually didn't close until about 2005. Uh, but the development plan at that time languished. And the current owner is actually taking a few steps to uh, secure the main building, because unfortunately, people have been getting in there and setting fires to the former patient wings and creating all sorts of havoc and vandalism. Uh, and the building itself, uh, portions of which have been sealed off since the 1970s, has been allowed to deteriorate by 
uh, time and, and nature and the elements, uh, but the developer has committed to at least stabilizing and securing the main administrative building and uh, about a half dozen or so other structures uh, for any redevelopment proposals that might see fit to include them in their plans. So it seems like some good things will be happening over there, it won't be entirely demolished. And then there's Wincliffe and Rhinebeck. Have you heard about this house? There was a much value auction for it last September. Probably the classical haunted house ruin along the Hudson River. Been abandoned since about 1950. It was built in the 1850s for a woman named Elizabeth Skirmer Horn Jones, uh, who was related by marriage to Astors and Livingston's. And if you believe the local lore, when she built this house, everybody else wanted to put additions on their house to build newer and bigger houses. So they came up with the expression keeping up with the Joneses. Believe it or not, um, that's one theory of how it came about. Uh, but this was one of the more um, imposing houses when it was built in the 1850s and was actively used for about 100 years and been slowly falling apart over the last now almost 70 years. Even the 20 or so years of time that I've been photographing, we go up there every couple of years and see another section come down. Uh, so it's been up for sale on and off and it's still up for sale again. What could you do with it? Obviously, a lot of those come down and require extensive stabilization and restoration, but someone has the money. You know, theoretically, it could be preserved, at least a substantial portion of it. Half the work of your demolition has already been done, you just got to stabilize what is there and rebuild from within. I think it's kind of simple. <laughs> We're optimists. We like to look on the bright side. Anybody recognize this building, the Branch and Pill Factory? Have you ever taken a and track train down along the Hudson River on the East Shore. Uh, you would have passed within about 100 yards of this building. And my favorite time to go and see was in the late afternoon when the sunlight uh, would hit it on the west side or a little bit of uh, light breaking across the north facade here. Uh, one of the more impressive industrial buildings constructed in Westchester County, in fact, was actually listed on the National Register of Historic Places for its architectural and historical qualities. Uh, it was actually a place where something called Alcock's Porous Plasters were produced. It was actually mentioned in Herman Melville's book, uh, Moby Dick, if you read it, you'll see a reference to the pills that were produced here at the pill factory. A uh, great piece of architecture that had been used uh, in some form or another through the 1990s when the last business went out of business and the next owner wanted to tear it down or maybe do some kind of partial renovation or restoration but could never quite get his plans approved by the uh, village board. Uh, I thought with this perfectly you know, wide open space here, it really lends itself well to adapt and reuse. You've got this huge open space with all these windows and natural light. You can do any number of things inside there. Uh, but here's really only interested in residential development and getting as many units as possible on that piece of land as he could be allowed. But never quite came to terms with the town and eventually the building was kind of just allowed to deteriorate at one point. And then he went through uh, without a permit, according to the town and started demolishing a portion of the building illegally. Uh, that matter got cleared up about a year later and subsequently the entire factory building was demolished. So uh, one of our favorite buildings is gone. We used to love going up there and photographing it, but now uh, just glad that we have our pictures of it to reminisce upon. And then there is uh, something maybe a little less dramatic. You know, there's places like Hudson River State Hospital and Wycliffe and Batman's all the grand elaborate building. But Tom and I were always interested in the broad spectrum of sites. Even this little humble wooden shed, which belonged to a fellow named Henry Gordine, uh, was a place that really uh, kind of made us wonder what happened here and who was here. And actually, if you go on YouTube, there's a lot of great interviews with Henry Gordine, who was uh, held in high esteem as one of the last shad fishermen along the Hudson River, uh, with his you know, decades of experience and stories, and kind of being on the Hudson River at the time of those pollution uh, lawsuits were being brought forth. That really kind of ended the uh, commercial fishing along the Hudson River. Uh, but Henry Gordine was an important person in Westchester County. And after he passed away, his shed remained there with his boats, his nets, his traps, and everything was all still inside there. The property was actually part of a piece of land that the village of Austin owned. It was apparently going to be turned into a town or a village park. But somehow, something behind the scenes happened. They turned it over to a developer who wanted to build condominiums there. And uh, Henry Gordine's fishing shed was in the way of the million dollar views. The developer, uh, Mark Ginsburg, said, don't worry, you know, we're going to respect the history of Henry Gordine and the story of fishing, and uh, you know, we'll, we're not going to demolish it, we'll take it apart piece by piece, we'll you know, rebuild it somewhere, and we'll tell the story of Henry Gordine. That was May 10th, 2007, the building was still there. A week later, a pile of lumber. So it had not been reconstructed piece by piece as Mr. Ginsburg had promised us, and we take it 
developer on their word. Uh, so you gotta be careful when people make promises. But uh, nevertheless, the park is actually called Henry Gordine Park. There's a little bit of public access there right next to the condominiums, but uh, his shed and his boats and nets are all gone now, unfortunately. But we were glad to get some photographs of it. At this point in time, I'll probably double back and forth a little bit since he knows a little bit more about the maritime. But this is the Hudson River Maritime Museum. We had to show you some old boats and old ruins. This is one we made a number of trips to going back to that maybe 2012 or so. Uh, the ferry boat Davidson actually was uh, a ferry between New York City and New Jersey in the early part of the 20th century up until that 1967, taking millions of passengers back and forth over the decades. And that was brought to uh, Edgewater, New Jersey in 1971 and became a restaurant in 1975. Tom had the pleasure of having dinner there about what, 2007? A couple of times. A couple of times. And uh, birthday dinner. Birthday dinner. And then it closed not too long after that. And then in 2011, there were a couple of storms, one in the spring, and then again, one in the fall, that really did a lot of damage to the boat. So this beautiful ferry boat, which was really one of the last of its kind, if not the last, uh, was partially submerged and damaged and really became uh, a wreck there along the Edgewater waterfront opposite New York City. And a lot of the interior details, maybe you might want to step in. I think you had said were kind of redone in the 20th century to some degree, so what you see is not what it looked like in 1907 or something like that. Did anybody here ever eat on it as a restaurant? What? It was a plank. Did, it, did anyone here ever actually eat on it as a restaurant? Is anyone familiar with it? We got one hand, yeah. It for, for, from the mid 70s through, we got at least one other hand. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it took me. Uh, well, in any case, yeah, I had you know, heard of these stories of, of Hudson River steamboats like the Alexander Hamilton and other things, and, and some had been used for restaurants, but it never really worked out. But this one was actually still around until relatively recent years, until uh, it wasn't, until it looked like this. Uh, but in any case, now we'd be lucky if it even looked like this, because, well, this is a historic photo of the same space. Wow. Uh, a lot in common with the kinds of riverboats that cross the Hudson, like up and down the Hudson the dock right here in Rondo. Uh, we managed to get some really amazing photographs of it. It made it a quite a beautiful ruin, although it was really kind of, I mean, extra heartbreaking because this is, was really, there's nothing else like this around. And these are some photographs that uh, a fellow called Glenn Remo took from the uh, Crazy Railroad Bridge, or the walkway over the Hudson, as some people insist on calling it, uh, with the uh, wreckage, the recently cleared wreckage of the last of the Hudson River steam ferries being hauled up to a scrapyard in Albany. This actually is a compliment to a photograph that appears in our book. Uh, these ferries often docked at places like this. This is actually, did anybody recognize where this is? This is down in Piermont, which is a nice little walk if you've never been down there. There are lots of nice little shops and restaurants, but the pier goes out a mile into the Hudson River. And that uh, was a ferry destination between uh, Irvington on the East Shore and uh, Piermont here on the West Shore. And uh, during World War II, it uh, was actually a major uh, point of uh, deportation for a lot of soldiers who were at uh, a major camp nearby in Rockland County. Uh, but nevertheless, the pier ruins have remained, and I thought they were very picturesque. Uh, structures end up their own right, and there is, I think, a springtime photograph in our book. This is a wintertime picture uh, with the river iced over. We would often go back to these places in different seasons or different times of day to kind of get different images. Uh, so, however, the light was, we would work with it and uh, just kind of you know, keep up with these ruins and see how they would change with the times and the years. And as a point of reference, I included Tom in the shop on the remains of a uh, steam vessel called the Storm King which actually now is not a storm came, it's up in the village of Kriksaki, up in Green County. And maybe you might want to share a few facts about it. Do we have the photo? Don't. I think so. Let's see. Oh, yeah. This is, this, the storm came had a really grand name. Grand sounding name, but it was not such a grand looking boat. <laughs> uh, this is what it looks like in its prime. So we have a couple of photographs here from the Western Maritime Museum and from uh, Roger Davies, is a, a name that will be recognizable probably to you. Uh, some people here. Uh, the Storm King had been built in 1911 as a freight boat for the Catskill Evening Line to run between Catskill and New York City. Uh, wound up, didn't have such a long life, but it uh, wound up basically abandoned on the Kaksaki waterfront in the early, by the early 1930s, it was kind of killed by the Great Depression uh, and highways and other things. Uh, but that's one of the kind of uh, maritime wrecks we got to photograph. 
these are some interesting ones that uh, are down in uh, Orange County, just uh, in the shadow of the Bear Mountain Bridge there. Uh, thought to be, at one point, uh, the, they were sloops turned into schooners. So the sloop sail, like the, that of the Clearwater, the, this is one of two hulks of vessels that are very, very similar to the Clearwater. Uh, and when they were identified or found by uh, officials of the State Office of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation about 15 years ago or so, uh, they were thought to be the only two uh, extant examples of the originals of what the Clearwater is a replica of. Uh, so they would have been built as Hudson River sloops and then turned into schooners. The interesting explanation for this being that that one big, huge, heavy sail of sloop took more people to raise it than two smaller sails, the schooner with two masts instead of one would have. So a number of Hudson River schooners were, or sloops, were adapted into Hudson River schooners, and these were two of those. This was an interesting one that could still have been seen until relatively recently as a ruin in Hastings on Hudson down by the Anaconda Wire Plant in Westchester, a uh, historic photo of it. And here's how it looked in more recent times, uh, just kind of abandoned in the weeds. Uh, it was a steamboat called the Lancaster that had been built uh, for service at Chesapeake Bay in the 1890s. Uh, in the 1920s, the company that ran it down there in Baltimore had gone belly up, so it turned into a, a night boat running between uh, New York and Albany overnight, kind of a budget night boat service in the late 1920s before it was abandoned. Uh, just before 1930, uh, it was stripped down to its steel hull. The hull was beached at Hastings, and it became used as a shad camp uh, for decades. It was a shad camp known as uh, Gus and Susie Pop's shad camp uh, that operated off of the hulk of the Lancaster before that disappeared in the 1960s. And so this thing just became a, a complete ruin after that. Uh, and you can still go kind of, you know, wade into the weeds and stick your head through portholes, as uh, I might have done. Uh, but unfortunately, just a few years ago, this little plot of land, and it's strange to say, unfortunately was turned into a park, but was turned into a park and the Lancaster was, was erased completely from the landscape. And I thought it would have been kind of neat to turn into a, like, a picnic bench or something, uh, but uh, it, that was not done. Uh, right around the same time, the village of Hastings took an image of the Lancaster and put it on all their historical markers around town. So, right with ironies, this subject of ours. Uh, this, one of the more uh, kind of amazing and captivating uh, Hudson River maritime ruins. Did anybody here uh, ever take the ferry from Newburgh to Beacon? Show of hands. Okay, at least four or five people. Well, this is the last surviving of the ferries that crossed between Beacon and Newburgh. It was called the Beacon. It was actually built in 1921 uh, and named the Lieutenant Flaherty and served the Boston Harbor until the late 1930s when it was brought to the Hudson River to uh, join the fleet of ferry boats that was already there. Uh, when the Newburgh Beacon Bridge opened in 1963, obviously they were all out of job. Uh, one of the older boats, the Orange, was earmarked to be preserved as a museum piece, but didn't wind up happening. The boat was kind of vandalized and thought to be beyond a point of restoration, so that uh, has since disappeared. But this one, the Beacon, which was towed off to be scrapped, never wound up being scrapped and is still languishing uh, in the Arthur Hill behind uh, Staten Island, which makes kind of a pretty interesting uh, little ruin. Anybody ever seen a concrete boat before? This is down in Nyack, right near the Tapaji Bridge. So if you want to go and see the Tapaji Bridge construction while it's still going on, it's a nice time to go and see the two bridges down there. It won't be for too long. Uh, but from Nyack Memorial Park, there's this wreck in the river before the bridge. And it's actually an old concrete boat that was built during World War I uh, to be used on the Erie Canal uh, when boat companies were looking at alternative uh, construction materials that's uh, steel. And actually, a number of these boats were built about 20 or so, and they actually were used for several years, but uh, they were found to uh, take, uh, displace more water and were damaged quite more easily. Uh, so they didn't really last very long, but they lasted surprisingly long enough. And uh, several of them can be found along the Mohawk River, and this one ended up down here in Nyack uh, to be used as a bulkhead for an expanded park that was never built, but yet the boat is still there. There's it's actually one here to run that creek. Oh, there you go. That one I haven't seen. So, uh, lots of maritime ruins out there. Uh, not only the ruins on the land, but in the water, too. 
The last one I'm going to leave you with, thank you all for waiting here tonight, is a place that's pretty popular. I know it's on the East Shore. Have anybody here been to this site called Northgate in Cold Spring? A uh, very easy hike to, uh, but also on the way to Breakneck if you want a more challenging hike. And one of those places that we've been photographing, at least I've been going up there since about 1997 or so, uh, my teacher Tom Johnson said, if you want to go photograph some ruins, go up to Cold Spring. He gave you a newspaper article that was written by uh, the Graymore Friary in Garrison explaining how to hike up there or find these ruins. But it didn't really have a lot of history about the estate. Nothing was much, much known about those who lived there, and there were no photographs of it, even in the local historical society. Uh, so I got onto the New York Times and found out that Edward and Sly and Cornish actually bought the property from a fellow named Sigmund Stern, who built the estate in the early 20th century. So there were two families that owned it, uh, the Stearns and later the Cornishes, although colloquially known as the Cornish estate. And we found out that it was actually known as North Gate. But uh, we go up there and photograph these ruins at different times of year. One of my favorite places to hike to, pretty easy to get to if you don't want to drive and you want to take the train. Just a short walk up from the train station. And we always wander out of there. He's saying, you know, somebody's got to have some photographs of this place, what it used to look like. It's got to be in somebody's garage or in somebody's attic. Uh, so it was one of those places that we wrote about in depth in our book and on our website and made note of the fact this is really one of the only places, if not the only one, where we have no idea what it looked like when it was built. You know, there were no known photographs in local repositories. In uh, early 2010, I received an email from not one but both descendants, uh, you know, the original owners, saying they had images and information and even video of the estate in the early 20th century, and we would be interested in seeing them. Of course, the answer was a definite yes. Uh, one of them came down from Maine to meet with us, and the other uh, family actually lived in Westchester County, a few miles away from where I lived, so that was great. You know, who knew, right in our backyard? Uh, so we met up with them, and we finally learned what the uh, Northgate Mansion looked like when it had been built. And it's actually a rather eclectic structure incorporating several different architectural styles with that uh, field stone that was kind of popularized in the early 20th century, places like the Bear Mountain Inn, and some of the shingle style architecture which was popularized in the late 1800s in places like Newport and other estates. And even a little bit of kind of like Frank Lloyd Wright Prairie, and even some old Tudor style architecture from the 19th century kind of still making its way in there. So a very eclectic structure. If you looked at the stones, you would have no idea what the building really looked like. And that was actually our main regret with not using our imagination to draw what we thought this house looked like before we found the photographs. But nevertheless, we were uh, very happy uh, to find them and find the information from uh, Victoria Roush and Connie Bloom. And Tom Johnson and I wrote an article for the Hudson River Valley Review in 2014, which has a, what we thought at the time was a definitive uh, history of the estate, and even since then, we still learn a little bit more about the property. So we're always learning more. People come up to us at lectures and say who the architect was, and they've given us floor plans of the house. We can find all sorts of cool stuff. That's really the best part of you know, why we do this. You know, we want to find out more, and people share it with us, and we want to share it back. And we've been meeting a lot of great people over the years who've helped us out. Uh, so it's just been, at the very least, a very fun hobby. You know, maybe we haven't physically saved some of these structures, but maybe in some way our actions might have helped to uh, lend some credence to why we think they're being worthy of preserve. Uh, but nevertheless, it's been a great hobby. It's allowed to meet a lot of people and get a lot of great information. And we put that out uh, in our book and in our exhibit, which is at the New York State Museum. We're very honored to be up there. Mm -hmm. We'll be up until the end of December, so if you haven't seen it, we have December 31st, all right? And it's free. And then uh, our book, which uh, is not free, unfortunately, not at the moment, unless you want to get it at the library. Uh, but we do have copies with us tonight, our paperback uh, for $30, and our hardcover for $40. And actually, the hardcover is actually going out of print, so we're happy to pay that landmark and have a uh, paperback edition. We'd be happy to sign it for you. That's free, the autograph. And then uh, for free, you can find us on the internet, at Facebook, on Instagram. Uh, so uh, check us out. If you've got something you want to share with us, we'd be happy to hear. Or if you have some correction, if you said something that was not correct, by all means, we want to be corrected too and get our facts straight. Uh, so you can find us on the internet as well. Um, and that's about, I think, what we've got to say tonight. So thank you for coming out and listening to us.